What's the connection between a stop sign and religion? I may have mentioned that in a couple of other podcasts earlier on that I've been doing a lot of commuting. I've been flying back and forth from Manchester over here in the United Kingdom across the pond and to Seattle where my wife has been living for several months now taking care of her father who's got a brain tumor and she's basically quit her job over here and moved over there full time right now to care for him. But one of the things that it's done for me, going back and forth, I actually hadn't been back to the States in nearly 10 years. I think the last time I was there was 2008, so it's been a long time since I've been there. We've been living over here in Great Britain for almost 12 and a half, nearly coming up on 13 years now. But you know, one thing I noticed about going back to America and driving around the Seattle-Tacoma area was that stop signs. There are stop signs literally everywhere. I found them at every intersection, every every stop that you come to, every turning. Even in parking lots, or car parks as Brits call them, everywhere you go in America, there's a stop sign telling you to stop, stop, stop. And if you don't stop, of course, there's always that ever-present fear. If you roll through the stop sign, there might be a policeman lurking somewhere nearby, and you'll get a ticket. You have to stop. You have to come to a complete and full stop before proceeding, even if there's not a car in sight. And you know what I noticed about when I came back home to Britain and I started driving around where we live here in North Wales? We don't have stop signs. They just really don't exist. In fact, it was kind of funny. I was just coming back from the store just a few minutes ago before I did this recording, and I noticed I think it's my first stop sign I've ever seen in this country. I actually saw one. I've seen one in 12 and a half years. And you know the difference between not having stop signs and having stop signs literally everywhere, like in America? Here in Britain, when you're learning how to drive in preparation to take your driver's test for your license, you learn the rules of the road. And the rule is, when you come up on an intersection or a cross street and you want to pull out, there's no stop sign because you don't need one. You can stop, you look both ways, make sure it's safe to proceed, and then you pull out. If you're stupid enough to pull out in front of a car and get hit, well, guess what? It's your own damn fault. But you know, in America, they have stop signs everywhere, and you don't even have to think. All you do is you see that red sign, and you stop. So what's the connection between stop signs and religion? Well, there's been a lot of studies done on this by sociologists of religion, and what they've done is they've done a tremendous amount of research and study asking people, in your estimation, in your experience, what is the purpose of religion? What purpose does it serve in your life? And in doing this research, what they have discovered is that most of the respondents believe that the purpose of religion is to be sort of that moral stop sign. People expect of their religion that it will provide essentially a moral structure, a moral code, or a framework by which to live their lives. And therefore, the purpose of this moral code is to provide that framework or a set of rules that will teach us the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, what makes God or the gods, if you look at classical religion, what makes them happy and what makes them angry. And if you look at the Bible in that way, for example, within Christianity, you can think of, if you know the Bible at all, lots and lots of verses, particularly in the Psalms, for example, and in the law, in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, that talk about things that please God, and then conversely, things that we do, you know, when we fall into sin or whatever the violation of the law or God's commandments are, these are things that make God angry, and it might lead to us being judged. Well, if you look at it that way and say, okay, the purpose of religion is to be that moral stop sign stopping me, and that's the purpose of going to church or being involved in a religion is that not only will it provide that moral framework for you, it'll tell you the difference between right and wrong. It'll actually, in, in many cases, enforce that stop sign, that moral code. If you go beyond it, you'll find yourself in trouble, whether it's with the church, in terms of church discipline. If you break too many rules, you might end up getting in trouble and even being kicked out of the church. Or in the case of, you know, you might be punished in the next life. If you do too many things, if you sin too much, you do too many things that God says are wrong, you're going to end up in hell, according to that framework. And you have to step back and go, wait a minute, maybe I need to deconstruct this whole system. Do you accept the rules of this game? Do you accept this construct? 
Because once you step out of that framework and you actually begin to see it for what it actually is, you don't need a moral stop sign like in this country. You don't need a stop sign at every intersection, every turning, every every road that you come to. You just have a common sense. You, you're operating sort of by a higher principle. It's, it's the rules of the road. Everyone agrees to do it and it works. Now, there's another aspect to this moral stop sign thing, and that is that what happens when you keep all the rules? Because again, studies have shown that what happens is the people, there's either one of two things that happen. When you violate a known rule within your religion, you, you roll through that stop sign, as it were, and you commit a sin or a grievance or a wrong or whatever, according to the codes of your religion, what happens is you feel bad. You feel shamed about yourself. And maybe God or the gods are going to be angry with you and they might even punish you. And so you're afraid. But then conversely, if you do keep all the rules and you stop at those stop signs every time and you do all the right things and you do them in the right way, you feel a sense of superiority and pride. And you can actually then look down your nose at the other people who aren't keeping those rules. So there's a sense of pride and superiority. So it's a kind of a two-edged sword. It's a double whammy. No matter which way you go, you either feel shamed or you feel a sense of pride, accomplishment. You feel like God is happy. God is pleased with you. And again, like I say, you can then look down your nose at somebody else. Now, this is all about deconstruction. It's all about asking those kinds of questions. What does this have to do with my conversation with Brian Staples, this part two that I'm bringing you today? Well, I'm glad you've joined me on this show, Mind Shift Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Clint Haycock. As I'm saying, I'm bringing you part two of a conversation that I had several weeks ago with a friend of mine, Brian Staples, that we actually went to Bible college together down in Portland, Oregon. And we talked last week about his journey of deconstructing his evangelical Christian faith. And you know, I've reflected on this, that it's a scary place to be, especially when it comes to the God question, which is where we were kind of ending it last week, talking about, are we sure? Are we ready to go down the complete atheist route? Or are we kind of staying, well, let's just, let's just sit in this agnostic position for a while. I'm just not sure. I'm not ready to say that there is no God because for someone like me, for someone like Brian, and maybe someone like you, if you're deconstructing your former faith, if you came out of the church, maybe you're thinking to yourself, wow, I'm not prepared to go that far or at least that far yet. I don't know if there is no God. But the thing is, this is what I'm saying, is that living in a world without stop signs can be a scary place. It can be a dangerous place, too, in terms of our own emotional, mental health. But I think for myself anyway, just speaking personally for myself, and I think Brian would agree with me, we've become completely different people. I feel like I'm becoming the person that I am. I'm not operating under all these constraints. I'm not worried about that cosmic policeman looking around the corner for every time I roll through that stop sign, as it were, and do the wrong thing or whatever. I can live by a higher code. I can do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. So I want you to join me in Brian Staples. We're going to go on into part two now. We're going to pick up a little bit where we left off last week talking about this issue of God and our views of God, how they've changed and kind of where we're at now. We're going to get into politics and religion, and then Brian's going to offer up some advice. And if you're coming out of evangelicalism or fundamentalism, this might be a good, healthy way for you to move forward in terms of your own deconstruction. So join me and Brian Staples for this episode, part two, One Man's Journey of Deconstructing Evangelical Christianity. I'm not prepared to say there is no God, but if yeah. by saying that, that, that actually makes a lot of sense mm-hmm. in some ways, especially in the problem of evil. Yeah. If you just say, look, there's no God. Evil happens, you know, mm-hmm. storms, fires, floods. It just yeah. happens. It's our, it's our world. And God isn't causing it. He's not behind it. He, you know, cause that, that's a lot of issues that people have with God is why didn't he stop it? Why didn't he, if he's yeah. all powerful, exactly. blah, blah, blah. Or why didn't he stop the latest mass shooting or, he could. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got to question all these things, but yeah. it takes you in a lot of weird places that it, it really does. It, people it, are uncomfortable yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. Evangelicals, anyway. Yeah, and that's that's where I'm kind of separating myself from that aspect of thinking about God involved with that, where I keep thinking about the man, the human aspect of all of that. Humanity side. And that's where I turned a completely, I, I've more or less turned away from the conservative mindset where. We're just going to leave all that alone. 
we're going to ignore it all. They don't matter. Who's they? Just anyone who doesn't they, agree with us? Pretty much anyone that doesn't agree with you. You know, they're, they do have this this mindset, or a lot of them, you know, at least where I come out of, uh, even still, that white American evangelical mindset. You know, even in the area where I live in, you know, in western Washington, the churches are still primarily white evangelical Christians. Yeah, that, and as we know, that's the, a lot of that is that 81% white evangelical voting block that not only voted for Donald Trump, people like mm-hmm. Jerry Falwell uh, at Liber- Liberty University, as well as the people who continue to support him. In fact, that number is going up, maybe unsurprisingly, that white evangelical Republican base is actually going up despite all of the stuff that's been coming out about Trump. So for me, that was kind of the last straw. And I've said this before that I said to myself, when I saw that full-throated support, people like Falwell Mm -hmm. Jr. and others, I said, I certainly don't want to call myself a Christian anymore. I don't want to be, whatever that means, I don't know. Exactly. But I do know that it's, I I want to be distanced from that, those people, if if you will. I don't want to be known as a Mm -hmm. Christian so yeah. I don't know if that makes me an atheist or an agnostic. Yeah. I don't know, but I don't know. It makes you a heretic. <laughs> that's Definitely. right. Uh, yeah, I know yeah, that's that, for that's, sure. That's one of the things because to look at a lot of the reactions, of a lot of my evangelical friends that I grew up with, that group of friends from the one church, their mentality. I've actually lost a lot of friends because of it, because I far from agree with their mentality. Uh, the whole DACA thing. They were just bashing it, and just I'm like, no, I don't agree with it. I don't, I don't agree with what your your stance is. I also think that these guys deserve a chance. Welcoming the immigrant, and that's mm-hmm. been pointed out in many articles and news stories, isn't it? That ironically, it's the Bible that talks about welcoming the immigrants and exactly. welcoming the stranger in your midst and making them feel at home, home in your society and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. And yet here's these Christians saying, no, we need to kick these people out. We need to build a wall. We need to, you know, isolate ourselves and, and share mm-hmm. share America with nobody else but ourselves, yeah. America yeah. first and all that. And somehow religion's all tied up in that. I don't know how they justify I all that, but they know. do. And weirdly enough. Yeah. So, yeah, you've lost friends over that. I was just reflecting the other day with somebody that my – one of my sisters, who's a very, I would say, fundamentalist Christian – apparently has disowned me. So I, I've just found that out in the last couple of weeks that because I'm I'm not a Christian anymore because I don't go to church and I haven't gone to church for over 10 years, she said, I don't want to have anything to do with him anymore, which I mm-hmm. thought is a bit strange, isn't it? Because I'm still her brother. We're still yeah. related on a human level. Mm-hmm. Surely doesn't she care about my life and my family and how we're doing? And nope. And that's the best strategy apparently is to stonewall me and to cut me off and never speak yeah. to me again. And how is that Christian? How is that exactly going to win me back to exactly. the fold, if you will? Yeah, I I don't understand exactly. that. The blacklist somebody and say, well, they're a write off mm-hmm. now. Yep. I think she's praying for me though. I'm pretty sure. Oh, probably that I'll come back into the fold. You know, start changing your attitudes. And I need to change my. I need to cut my hair <laughs> and and cut my beard and you know cover up the tattoos <laughs> and. <laughs> I'm not going to get them lasered off. There's too many hours of of pain and blood and sweat and tears in that (laughs) to do that now. But it's just, I don't understand that. And and you see that a lot on the ex-evangelical Facebook page, don't you? That people who are really hurt by fundamentalist slash evangelical family members, parents, grandparents who are just cruel Mm -hmm. to them when they announce that they don't want to go to church anymore and and whatever. It's unbelievable. But maybe it isn't. Maybe it isn't unbelievable. I don't know. I think a lot of it just depends on where, how legalistic they are. I know that's where my wife came out of. Her family was very legalistic. And I still hear a lot of it. As a result, she wants to stay here, leave her family kind of over in Idaho where they're from. Yeah, stay over on this side of the country. And yeah, yeah. Well, that's, it's, a, it's been an amazing thing living mm-hmm. over in the United Kingdom for us because I didn't realize what was going on, but we're not in that evangelical subculture. You know, there yeah. are evangelical churches in Britain, but the word evangelical means something different there. It's more like Bible believing yeah. kind of thing. It's not about the evangelistic mm-hmm. and all the fervor and all the hype yeah. and everything. Yeah. We don't really have mega churches like you guys do here. It's funny because I was driving to a job the other day and I counted on about a 30 block drive. I counted, I think, eight churches that I passed by. Wow. In a 10 minute drive to this job I was working on. And, and some of them are huge. Mm-hmm. I had to laugh because on one particular street here in Tacoma, 
there were literally two massive churches right next to each other. There was a street in between them, but they were on the same side of the street and slightly different, you know, denominations. Yeah. And I was thinking, really? I mean, they're literally right next door, door to each other, these two mm-hmm. churches. What is it that makes these churches so different from the other that, that one would say, I'm the true church and you need to come here on Sunday or you could go next door and that's a, that's a different option? I, I don't understand. It's an American okay. thing. It is. It is. You know, you can remember these competitions, you know, someone goes to this particular church. Well, you need to come here. You need to come here. Why should I go there? Well, because you need to come here. They can never answer it. They can never answer that question. Mm-hmm. But right next door, the church that I was referring to that I could throw a rock and hit it, it's actually a Seventh-day Adventist church. And I noticed I was sitting at the traffic light the other day, and they have a big uh, reader board up in front of the church. And it says, Bible study Wednesday night. Um, it says, please come to our services Saturday. Now I thought, well, at least the Seventh Day Adventists—they they are they're proclaiming why they're different. Yeah, we have churches on church service on Saturdays. It, I guess if you come to the Wednesday night Bible study that's being advertised, they'll teach you why what they consider you know worshiping on the Sabbath and all that to be the correct interpretation. Yeah. Some SDA churches that we we know are quite legalistic. Yeah. They'll say that all other churches that meet on Sunday are are heretical and yeah. blah blah blah. So at least the SDA have their own uh, theology that's pretty clear. Yeah. As compared to all the other churches that yeah. want you to come on Sunday. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mega churches. There's yeah. about 30 of them in this within five minutes of my house, the house right here. Oh, I know. You know, some huge churches. It's unbelievable. Uh, uh, where I live, I'm actually in a uh, peninsula just outside of Gig Harbor. And we actually have, I can count probably at least probably four or five churches out there. And we're talking, it's a community probably about three, 4,000 people out there. So They're Not huge, but big enough to be, you know, its own kind of community. Yeah, exactly. And there's still a lot of church. Mm-hmm. Although you did post the other day on uh, the group, on Exvangelical, about a church that's closing. Isn't it a Lutheran church? Yeah, it was, in I think it's area? a Lutheran, Lutheran church. It's actually out in Bremerton. Right, it's not uh, too far yeah. from you, but yeah, it's, not it's too an old far. church. It's it, been it's there. A, yeah, it's been there like over 100 years. Over 100 years, and it's closing yeah. down basically due to lack of interest mm-hmm. that there's yep. a small congregation 15 to 20 people yep. left and they're yep. all quite old and mm-hmm. this is happening to a lot of different places and there's just nobody to take up the torch and yep. and you know keep it going to the next generation mm-hmm. that's certainly something that's that's um, not just an american thing is that people are leaving the churches and not coming back they're they're embracing spirituality and whatever but exactly. they're leaving the churches in droves really mm-hmm. certainly among millennials there's the sense, I think, that you lost me, not the other way around. Exactly. You know, I was trying to be a, a faithful, good member, but you pissed me off with mm-hmm. your support for Trump or, or whatever it exactly. is. Exactly. That's not who I'm. That's not our my my yeah. views, and I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. And they're not coming back. Yeah. Well, it's amazing how much of those they're upsetting people. They're upsetting the millennials, and family members are doing much of the same thing. Because that's what, you know, with my wife, that's much what, what's happened with her family. She's still trying to, you know, main con- maintain contact with, you know, her, her parents. But, you know, much of her extended family, uh, she's got a couple of cousins she wants to still maintain contact with. The rest of them are like, you guys preach this stuff, but you guys live totally different. You're not living it according uh-huh. to that, yeah. I was talking to a friend of mine the other week. We went to lunch in Seattle, and he said, "If you if people tell me they're Christians, I say that's great. I'm I'm glad for you. I'm I'm happy for you. We both grew up in church and and everything else, and we both walked away from it." And then he starts yeah. asking him about, "Are you do you follow the teachings of Jesus?" And when he starts pressing him on the specific things, how do you love other people? Because it's pretty clear that the Bible says we have to love one another, exactly. And, you know, help each other and all that. And, mm-hmm. and they start to struggle. At that point, that's uh-huh. when it starts to break down. Mm-hmm. And he says, you know, I'm not buying it. Yep. If you show me that you're living consistent with the message that you claim to follow, the person that you claim to follow, then that's great. And I'm, exactly. I'm happy, you know, I'll, be, I'll, I'll get on board with that. Mm-hmm. But most Christians that he meets can't really back that up with specific. They can point exactly. to certain things like we're talking about. I mean, watching my, my in-laws right now, my father-in-law struggling with a brain tumor now, they've been in this church where they're at for 30 years. Wow. Now, they have done, they have served selflessly. They've tithed. They've cleaned the building every Saturday for free for years and years and years. They painted the building. They mowed the lawn every week. I mean, unbelievable what they did and what they have done serving this church. Now that he's sick, nobody has come to visit or very, very few people. They're gone. 
Yeah. And all those practical things you were talking about have not been done. And it's the people mm-hmm. who are not part of the church who have done far more, far and yep. away more to help him and their yep. family. The church has just disappeared. Oh, yeah. And they're 10 minutes from their house. It's it's right there. That's, people live right in the area. That is the sad part. Where are they? That's they're the not part. there. I hear stories like that. And it's like, what's going on here, you know? But like you, they, they'll say, we're praying for you, Larry. We're mm-hmm. praying for you. But we, okay, pr- you can pray for them, fine. But we need people to come do their laundry. We need people to come mow their lawn. We need people to come do specific, tangible things that can physically help donate to their GoFundMe page and things like that. Same thing with the house we're in now with Jeff. Where are they? Where Mm -hmm. are they? They're not there. And some people say, well, we, we won't, we don't talk to them anymore because they don't go to church anymore. So it's unbelievable. How would you say that church has affected you? Because one of the things that comes out a lot of these conversations is the mental health aspects, Mm -hmm. the emotional, the damage that's been done by your background in church and all that. Can you talk maybe a little bit about how it's affected you in in those ways, maybe in emotional ways, psychological ways? I don't know. Are you triggered by things? Then you go, oh, that was from my back, my my backstory. A lot of what's triggered, and I just started realizing this probably in the last few days, a lot of what's starting to trigger me is a lot of the racism, a lot of the, uh, the homophobia, a lot of that type of stuff. I'm like, I hear that stuff, and I'm getting upset that somebody would dare talk like that. Three, four, or five years ago, I probably would have said, oh, okay, immigration? Well, we only have so much room here. No more room for the immigrants. No more room for... And that was, that was, a, that was a very common mindset you know, for uh, the circles I was around. And like coming out of that white I'm supremacist kind of mentality. Exactly. You would have heard that sort of rhetoric growing up mm-hmm. in the church. Yeah. And now you're hearing it from what? Christians? Mm-hmm. Spouting this stuff. Yeah. And the scary part is, is that I fell pretty easily into that because I was involved with that. But as I started really looking at it, and my wife was a major help in this and helping me understand this is not right to be able to reach out. To look at the teachings of Jesus, that we are supposed to love everybody. We're supposed to be open up to everybody. We're supposed to help the needy. That's what we're supposed to do. And yet, we're turning these immigrants away. We're not helping them. We're sending them back to Mexico or wherever Mm -hmm. they came from. ICE is deporting them left, right, and center. And this is part of the policy of the Trump organization, administration. Yeah, so we're seeing this. And it's interesting, isn't it? When When you're triggered by those things... I've done the same thing and something suddenly triggered me and I thought, whoa, where is this mm-hmm. coming from and why is it affecting me so viscerally, so, you know, emotionally? And you realize, yeah, that's something from my past exactly. that I thought was all gone and done mm-hmm. with. And yeah. no, it's not. Mm-hmm. It absolutely isn't. So this stuff lasts with us. It, it stays with us. You know, I talk yeah. about PTSD and other things that people have mm-hmm. that come out of not just Christianity, but Islam and Judaism as well, these Abrahamic religions, you know, the patriarchy and Mm -hmm. some of the other things. It's just unbelievable that that we have to get counseling and therapy to be healed from what we experience in the church of all places. Exactly. This is the place that's supposed to be loving Mm -hmm. and accepting and a fellowship and a community. And Mm -hmm. and for some people, it is those things. Yeah. I mean, for my my in-laws, it was up until the point when he got sick. Mm -hmm. They loved it. They couldn't say enough good things about the church. Then, when they were in need, the church vanished. Yep. So where was all that loving community? When they were contributing to it, they were welcome as they were healthy yep. and fine and everything. And then when they needed something, nope, yep. they're gone. Exactly. They've cut you loose. Exactly. I know that since I broke away from the church that I was going to in Gig Harbor, I've run across a pastor, youth pastor, and several others that are from that church. They know you, obviously. They know me. They either try to run away, or if there is no way, oh, hi, Brian. And then they just, there's no small talk, there's no nothing. Literally turn their back. Yeah, exactly. It's funny, because I ran into a guy the other day at Starbucks. I was just dropping in there. I I had dropped my mother-in-law off at church on the Sunday morning. I'm like, I'm not going to church. I went across the street to the Starbucks just to grab a quick coffee, and someone called my name, and I was like, who's that? Some guy that I went to Christian high school with 20-some years. I haven't seen this guy. Somehow he recognized me. Oh, wow. I look a little bit different than I did yeah. in high school. A little bit more hair, a little bit more tattoos. I didn't have any tattoos then. But he, he said, um, so what church did you go to? That was his first question. I said, well, actually, I don't, I don't go to church. And then he kind of launched into why. You know, he was just shocked because 
he was he was playing on this worship team and they had they had done their rehearsal for the morning set and they'd come over to the Starbucks to get a quick coffee before the service started and I guess he assumed I was probably going to get a coffee before I went to church and I you know and he started kind of grilling me on why aren't you going to church oh, what, wow. what what would it take to get you back in the church and all this kind of stuff and I'm like you know what let's just not go there right now mm-hmm. I I don't I don't think you want to hear what I have to say <laughs> no. He wouldn't and, have been happy. So I kept it light and I just said, look, man, you know, we, we yeah. just kind of left and it's a long story and I don't really want to get into it. And I don't think you want me to get mm-hmm. into it. Nope. So I'm just curious now. We're kind of running toward the end of this thing. What advice would you give for people? Cause I, I kind of ask this question a lot of times is people who are, who are deconstructing because there's a lot of fear in there. This is our very identity. This was our identity yes. for 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever many decades. Mm-hmm. You start walking away from that. It's a scary thing. Where are you going? You don't know. What advice would you give for people that are kind of on this sort of journey of deconstruction? Find a good support group. The Exvangelical group is a great group to to find that. Granted, there's a wide array of beliefs in there. Oh, yeah. There's all all kinds of different things going on. On the most part, you're finding yourself very affirmed. For what, yeah, for is. what you believe. And there's a lot of people that can be in where, where you're at. I know there's a lot of people that believe as I believe. I know my wife and I are kind of, we're still kind of gelled in where we're believing. I think I'm probably a little less of a believer than what my wife is. Whereas my wife there for a long time had actually gone completely. And so it's kind of, we did the seesaw effect. Yeah, you were so back and forth a bit. I would say that the best thing to do is find a good support group. And Even just if it's one. online, that's, that's exactly. something, that's a lifeline it, it for is. a lot of people. It is. That group is, mm-hmm. yeah, because I think one of the things about it that struck me right away was that it's empowering to mm-hmm. find hundreds, there's over 2,500 people in that group, and not everybody is active on it, but there's a lot of people who have the same backstory as we do or a similar one, and you go, okay, I'm not alone in this thing. I'm not crazy. There's a lot of other people out there who are doing a lot of the same things I'm doing that came out yeah. of the background. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, finding that support group is huge, isn't yeah. it? And we've had two ex-evangelical get-togethers here in Seattle, exactly. which has been really good, just kind of getting to know people mm-hmm. and hearing that story. Yep. And you go, okay, there, there's a, at least a few of us out here mm-hmm. who are willing to take a Friday or Saturday night out and just meet other people who are in this group. Yep. Well, the nice thing about that was that uh, I was gonna, I was gonna leave off, leapfrog off that anyways within the evangelical group because there's so many. I was what over two thousand people involved. Yeah, Twenty five hundred, I think. Like, yeah. yeah, and they do have a uh, a link there with a page where you put where you're from, and you can see all the people that you're from. And having these get-togethers to be able to meet up has been a great, great connection. I made some really good connections. Uh, obviously, reconnecting with you, Clint. Yeah, after good. how many years? <laughs> Too many years. Too Let's many not years. Talk about it. Uh, and then connecting up with some others that are in similar boats as what we are. Yeah, I think it's been really good uh, for sure, as you say, to have those. Because I, when I was coming over here, I thought, you know what? We need. I'm just going to throw this out there. I didn't know if anyone would respond. I think Brian, you were the first person. Yeah. I said, I'm going to be in Seattle for a couple of weeks. Is there anyone who's even interested in getting together? I don't know. Maybe no one's going to respond. But we had probably seven or eight people, I think, at the first meeting. And we had yeah. a sim- maybe a few less the, la- the last yeah, time we met, few, but it was yeah. really good. Exactly. Um, it was a bit crazy because it was in a restaurant and it was yeah. kind of noisy. And I think they were looking at us like, um, why, when are you leaving? You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But it was good. I mean, we got to know some, some new faces, though, in, exactly. that, in that group. So. Yeah, it's good having that community, whether it's online or if we can meet in person. That's mm-hmm. good because a lot of people feel like they're alone in this thing, and they're exactly. not alone. They're not mm-hmm. alone, and it's good to hear stories like yours and, yeah. and just hear what you know real people talking about mm-hmm. their lives yeah. and where they're going now. Yeah. So, thanks, Brian Staples, for being on Mindship Podcast. This has been Thank a great you. conversation. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you have. Oh, I have too. This has been really good. We'll talk again. All right. Have you been disowned by your fundamentalist family or evangelical relatives like me? Well, guess what? I've got news for you. According to what Brian and I were just talking about, you're not alone. And that's the best part of this whole thing is learning that there is a huge community and it's an ever-growing community 
of ex-evangelicals like myself, like Brian, and like his wife Krista, who have walked away from the church and possibly the Christian faith as well, deconstructed it all, trying to live in a world, as I said before, without stop signs. And guess what? There's a huge community out there. You can find that community. You can find that support. And if you message me, I will put you in touch. If you're not already in touch with any of these other people out there like myself, like Brian, I will put you in touch with people from that community. That's the beauty of this whole thing. There are more and more and more voices coming out and talking about their story, their journey, like that of Brian and his wife. Where they're, where are they going? We are not sure, but we're not going back to the way it was before. That's for damn sure. And I want to hear from you. You can always get a hold of me. Probably the best way, as I say every week, is to follow me on Twitter at MindShift2018. You can find me as well in the show notes. There's a variety of different ways that you can get a hold of me on social media. Now, what's coming up in the next few weeks? Well, I'm going to be talking to Daniel Hobbs, who is very active on Twitter for sure. He's, he's getting a bigger and bigger following on Twitter all the time, and he's quite vocal about his criticism of the evangelical church, and that has led him into a lot of weird places, and he's gotten trolled and smashed and bashed by his former evangelical friends, and I want to find out. We're going to talk to him next week about why is he doing that? What's his motivation? What's his backstory? And what he really hopes to accomplish by doing all of this and putting himself out on the firing line in a way much like our guest of a few weeks ago, Steve Stone Sr., who's all over Facebook and getting smashed and trashed and trolled all over the place on Facebook. So what's what's Daniel's motivation? The other thing, too, is while this episode airs, of course, I'll be back in Seattle. What I'm doing now is I'm doing all these recordings in preparation. I'm actually doing them before I've left for Seattle, so they're going to drop as I'm there, so I don't have to worry about putting them out week in and week out every Friday. I'm going to be interviewing a couple of friends of mine, Bob Grayman and Jeff Judd. We tried to line this up the last time I was there. We couldn't quite make it work, but we all went to Christian school together, and we've got some absolutely amazing stories about what it's like to grow up in a very fundamentalist, very small Christian school. And so Bob and Jeff have some just unbelievable, shocking, ironic, weird, and strange stories about growing up evangelical. So look for those coming out after the conversation with Daniel Hobbs. And then and, and, and sometime in August, I'm going to be getting Gary Hayes back in there. He's been on the podcast a few times in the past before. And also my sister Valerie's coming to visit. We did an episode last year on surviving a fundamentalist upbringing. So we're going to be doing one while she's here on The Rock in North Wales. We're going to be talking about what's changed for both of us in the last year. So we got some amazing content headed your way. So stay tuned for all this great content right here on MindShift Podcast. Podcast. 